Well, thank you. It's thank you for the invitation to speak here. It's a big pleasure and a great honor. Um, so yeah, I want to speak uh, about my work on torsion in the homology, or cohomology, it doesn't really matter, uh, of locally symmetric spaces. And in fact, I think the two first two lectures will just I will just spend them on explaining what the statement of this result is. And so in fact, the, the general plan of the lectures will be that in this first lecture, uh, well, maybe some general introduction. And in the second lecture, I will really explain the statement. and give an explicit example <coughs> for what this says and I guess for the experts it will only get interesting really in the third lecture where I will give, well I will try to give some idea of the proof. Okay, so let me start by recalling some very basic Galois theory. <coughs> so, uh, so what number theorists are interested in are the rational numbers and also their finite extensions. So this amounts to studying the field of algebraic numbers inside the complex numbers. So this is a set of all Let's call them alpha, all complex numbers, <coughs> such that there exists some polynomial with rational coefficients, with some x to the n plus all coefficients are rational numbers, such that alpha is the root of this polynomial. And some of the basic observation of Galois theory is that <coughs> if you think purely in terms of algebraic equations, then there is no way, there's no algebraic way of distinguishing a positive square root of two, say, from a negative square root of two. <coughs> and so what this means is that if you consider what's called the absolute Galois group of Q, and sorry. This means that if we consider what's called the absolute Galois group of Q, which is just the automorphisms of <coughs> this field Q bar, so meaning those bijections with res which respect the addition of the multiplication structure, um, there are quite a few of them. So, <coughs> and Galois showed how one can uh, somehow match the study of the finite extensions of the algebraic numbers with the study of this big group. And so let me give a few comments about this group. So whenever I have an algebraic number, I can look at the orbit It's actually just a finite set. So why is this? So we know that if it's algebraic, then there exists some p such that p of alpha is zero. But this implies that 
the same equation is also true after applying any field automorphism. So if you take any element of the Scalver group, and apply it to alpha, then this polynomial will still vanish on <coughs> this conjugate. And so this means as p has only finitely many roots at most n, the orbit has to be finite. And using this, we can introduce a topology on this Galois group. So So that's the weakest topology such that for all algebraic numbers, the map that sends gamma to gamma times alpha is a continuous map. But in fact, this takes only finitely many values, so asking this continuity property is equivalent to asking that for all alpha, the stabilizer of alpha is open. It's an open subgroup. So this makes the sky a topological group, and as just a topological space, it's a contour set. Let me give one more definition and then an example. So if we ha I have a finite extension of the rational numbers, finite just meaning it's finite dimensional as a Q vector space. Um, let's call it Galois. if it is stable under the action of the Scalver group. So let's look at this in two examples. So let's first do this example of the square root of two. So if K is the square root of two, Q adjoined the square root of two. So concretely, that's just the set of all A times E, the square root of Q, where A and B are rational numbers. Then if I let the absolute Gara group act on the square root of two, then the orbit will be all possible roots of two inside the complex numbers. So that's the square root of two and minus the square root of two, both of which are contained in K. <coughs> and so this means that if I let this group act on K, it's Galois. And by the way, I should say that in this case, if it's Galois, one also has a Galois group of K over Q, which is just the automorphism group of K, which is a finite group. So in this case, the Galois group of K over Q is, say, a symmetric group in two elements uh, via the action on those two elements. So the second example is if I decide to adjoin a third root of two to Q. So that's the set of A plus B times the square root of two plus C times square root of four. 
can check that this set is stable under addition and multiplication. <coughs> so then if I let the absolute Gaura group act on a third root of two, then the orbit will again be all possible third roots of two in the complex numbers, but now there are three of them. It's a third square root of two. But you can also apply it by multiply it by a third root of unity, which is e to the two pi i over three, or By this, uh, the picture would be in complex numbers. You have somewhere two, you have somewhere one, and then there's a third square root of two somewhere here, and then there are these other two guys here. And so, obviously, these elements are not contained in K, simply because K consists only of real numbers, whereas these other guys are not all real. But you can improve this. So third example. So if you take this extension and also add a third root of unity, so now this has a chance of being Galois because now these other roots are also in there. And in fact, you can easily check that this is now really Galois. And Now it's Galois group is isomorphic to the symmetric group in three elements. Again, why is the action on the three element set consisting of these three root third roots of two? So what Galois theory tells you is that uh, you get a bijection between the finite extensions contained in Q bar. and the open subgroups, let's call them H, of the absolute gamma group. Whereas associating any K to the set of all those alphas such that all those elements of the gamma group such that for all elements in K, Uh, they don't act on it. So in other words, it's a subgroup which fixes K point-wise. And conversely, if I have a subgroup, I can associate to it the fixed vector under this open subgroup, which are all those alpha such that for all gamma and H, it preserves. So in other words, <coughs> This absolute Galois group is somehow a way of encoding all the possible finite extensions of the rational numbers. And uh, a number field is Galois if and only if the associated uh, subgroup is a normal subgroup. In other words, it's invariant under conjugation. And the second part is that Q bar is actually the union over all finite Galois extensions. And so the, auto, the absolute Galois group you can think of this as the inverse limit of all such K of the automorphism groups 
of these finite extensions. So all of these are finite groups. And so this absolute Gower group is naturally a profinite group. Profinite just meaning an inverse limit of finite groups. <coughs> and so, in other words, everything that I'm about to say over about this absolute Gower group is really a statement about one of these finite quotients, but without specifying which finite quotient we're talking about. So, <coughs> and so if you're trying to understand this profinite group, so it's an inverse limit of finite groups, and one way to understand it is to understa by understanding the maps to finite groups of Lie type, say. So, So meaning groups such as TLN of a finite TLFP. Because after all, some almost all the finite simple groups, they are finite groups of Lie type. And so it's certainly interesting to understand all these quotients, which are such finite groups of Lie type. And these will play some of a central role in these lectures. So, um, so for this reason, I will give them a name. So, a finite Galois representation. Is a continuous map. Rho from this absolute Galois group to some GLN. And in fact, I might also allow bigger finite extensions of FP, but that's a minor point. So in other words, giving such a finite color representation um, is equivalent to, first of all, so the kernel of rho would be an open subgroup. And so in particular, this defines a field corresponding to rho, which is a fixed field under this H, a finite extension of Q. So, so really, what you have to do is, first of all, specify this finite extension of Q. And it's supposed and some of that there is this map means that its Galois group has a very specific form. So it's Essentially, this finite group of Lie type, or maybe a subgroup of it. And so, what I'm talking about in the series of lectures is the following diagram. So, in the center, you have these finite Galois representations. Actually, one reason one might find them interesting is that there is a geometric way of constructing those. Namely, whenever you have a variety of a Q, the variety you can think of simply as a system of polynomial equations. just some geometric object which is cut out by polynomial equations with rational coefficients. And by some black box called etal cohomology, which I will explain later in an example, 
one can go from there and produce some finite Galois representations, which remember a surprising lot of information about this geometric structure you have here. <coughs> and on the other hand, there's a completely separate way where these finite Galois representations occur, which is in some sense much more mysterious. So, namely, that's some of the topic of these lectures, in the torsion homology of locally symmetric spaces. So for some rather mysterious reason, A, this also gives rise to finite Galois representations. And in fact, there's a conjecture that, called Sayers conjecture, that act actually everything comes from the torsion homology of uh, locally symmetric spaces. So, so there are somehow two big problems in this area. The first thing is torsion homology actually gives rise to Galois representations. And then there's a second, much harder problem, which I won't say nothing about, uh, called Sayers conjecture, which is that with a very small caveat, so only almost, but really a very small thing, uh, all finite Galois representations occur in this way. Uh huh, okay, so. I mean, A is now the theorem, and B is far from the theorem, so. <laughs> And in any case, somehow in the classical case of GL2 over Q, A was very easy and B was very hard. <laughs> so. And so what I will do today is uh, just explain why such a statement would be interesting. lecture about A. <coughs> okay, so let me do this fam very famous example. So, so for now, let's start with just with an elliptic curve. So let E by Q be an elliptic curve. So what does this mean? So it has a zero section, just a point called zero. <coughs> and the complement of zero uh, can be written as this set of solutions to the following equations, just the cubic equation, two variables, which can be brought into uh, the standard form, so where a and B are just any rational numbers satisfying that the discriminant, which is probably 4A cubed plus 27B squared, is non zero. So it's certainly very easy to write down such objects. And they're of immense interest to number theorists. Um, so if you draw the real points of this elliptic curve, uh, then draw the x-axis and the y-axis, then there's a 
this famous picture of some bubble and some such line, or well, not line, but anyway. Um, and then there is off at infinity this point called zero. Oh. <laughs> Unfortunately, called, it's called zero, but uh, anyway. Um, and so it turns out that E of k is naturally in a BN group. with zero given by this point called zero, that's why it's called zero, um, for any characteristic zero field k. And so in this picture, you can see the group structure in the following way. So if you have a line which intersects this cubic and three points, p, q, and r, then what you demand is that p plus q plus r equal to zero. Okay, and so if you look at the set of solutions to this elliptic curve over some over the complex numbers, then you can find out that as a topological space, it's actually homeomorphic to donut. Or a different way of saying this is that is that it's this is C module a lattice lambda, where lambda isomorphic to Z2 and C is a lattice. So the picture is that. You have such a lattice and identify opposite sides and then the next tense is so if you fold these two lines together and the other two lines together, you get this. <coughs> and so this implies the following. So for any field E, uh, K let K of N let E k brackets n denotes the kernel of multiplication by n. Then, if you look at this over the complex numbers, then you see that, say, if n is 3, then the three torsion points are these dotted points here. Or oh, another way of saying is that this is the points in one over, over n times lambda modulo lambda. So just abstract these as, as an abelian group. It's c mod n z squared. But uh, these n square points are solutions to an algebraic equation simply because all the structures on this elliptic curve are given by polynomial equations. And so this means that <coughs> all of these a priori complex valued points are actually algebraic numbers. And so <coughs> the end torsion of this elliptic curve of a Q bar, as in the BN group, is just C mod NZ squared. And so the absolute Gara group naturally acts on these end torsion points, because it acts on the algebraic numbers. And so say if you take n equal to p a prime, <coughs> then what this gives you, something we might call rho ep, it's a map from the absolute Gavra group into the automorphisms of these, this p torsion group.
which is just uh, DL2. So we somehow started with this interesting geometric object and using the torsion points in this elliptic curve, you have cooked up a Galois representation. And that's actually a special case of this very ma general machinery called the tar cohomology. And now let's specialize a bit further. And so let P be a prime at least five. And let's look at a solution to the equation A to the B plus B to the P plus C to the P equals zero, where A, B, C are non-zero and integers. Yeah. Of course, we want to show that there are no such solutions. So, uh, uh, an idea put forward by Frey in, in particular, but also I think by other people like Helguage, I don't know, uh, was to study this while looking at the following elliptic curve. So the elliptic curve looks like following, so it's x minus x times x minus x to the p times x plus b to the p. That's not exactly in this form, but it doesn't really matter. <coughs> or Everything works the same. And so if you look at the pairwise differences of the zeros, then of course if you take look at the difference here, it's a to the p. If you look at the difference between those two, it's b to the p. But now if you look at the difference between those two, it's the sum of a to the b and b to the p. And by our assumption, that's again a piece of power. Um, so this implies that the discriminant is actually a piece of power, which is somehow key to the following arguments. And so now what we do is we look at the p torsion for this very same prime p that we used up here, uh, which is now a map to GL2FP. And it has some very good properties. <coughs> Namely, it's, I will not say what precisely what this means, but it's very little ramified, so it's unramified outside 2 and p, and has very little ramification at those primes. And then Sayer conjectured that in this case, rho AP has to arise from a modular form of way two and level called gamma naught. I will say later maybe what precisely this means, <coughs> but it's somehow an instance of this conjecture that anything, any finite color representation should arise from the torsion homology of locally symmetric spaces. And we can pre say precisely where it should appear. Um, but here the observation is simply that there are no such modular forms. So for this reason, rho EP cannot exist. which implies from us not zero. 
And so this is what Wiles and Taylor Wiles prove. And actually, you also see, use the theorem of Ribbit, which tells you that ex actually you can find it exactly there. So the, some of the principle of this machinery is that from very general geometric situations, you can produce via tall cohomology these finite color representations. And from the geometry, you also know where they should appear in the torsion homology. And then you can just do a computation whether there is anything there. And if there is not, then some of these geometric situations that you're contemplating cannot exist, actually. And Now, well, before going on, let me also say that um, I've mostly worked with the absolute Gaia group of Q, uh, but actually something similar should work for any finite extension of Q. Let me draw again the diagram. So now in the middle you have the absolute Galois group of K, which is just those field automorphisms of Q bar, which fix K point-wise, going to some ZLM. And then by a tall cohomology, you can now uh, build such guys for any variety whose defining coefficients are in this field K. And again, there should be this connection with the torsion homology. for the group GLN over this field K. And in my lectures, I will consider, I will discuss two cases in detail. So the first case, which is classical, is the case where N is two, and I'm really working over the base field Q. which is somehow where this example fits in. And this in the second case, n is still equal to k 2, but uh, I enlarge my field and I take q adjoin the imaginary unit. <coughs> so I might also consider uh, still k is q, and bigger n, but then there are very large dimensions, these examples, and it's hard to make things explicit, so I'd rather stick to this different example. And so uh, today I want to start with explaining what happens uh, for GL2 over the base field Q. <coughs> so that's the business called modular curves. Um, so what, what do we have here? So the basic object in this case is the complex upper half plane. So all those complex numbers whose imaginary part is positive. And if I write tau as x plus i, y, uh, then this carries a natural uh, hyperbolic metric 
by this formula. And so you can also regard this as two-dimensional hyperbolic space. And as a group of isometries of H2 as a two-dimensional hyperbolic space uh, is a group PSL2 of R. And so if you have a matrix ABCD in there, then it acts by sending tau to this fractional linear transformation A tau plus B over C tau plus B. And then what I do to get arithmetic into the picture is that I take a congruent subgroup of SL2 of the integers. So this means that gamma contains a subgroup of those matrices which are the identity module with some large number n. So in other words, it's the subgroup given by congruence conditions on the entries. <coughs> and then I can define the modular curve, which in this case is this locally symmetric space I'm talking about, a GL2 over Q. So it's just the quotient of this two-dimensional hyperbolic space by the action of this congruent subgroup gamma. And so again, I can draw this. If gamma is SL2z, then you have this famous picture. So you have somewhere zero, somewhere one, somewhere you have the imaginary unit, somewhere you have minus one, and then if I draw these straight lines and I draw some circles, so here's one plus one minus one plus i, one plus i. Here's some called row and here's some row squared, where a row is a sixth root of unity. Um, then this area here is a fundamental domain. which thus essentially represents uh, this quotient. And you see that there is something strange going on at these points i and rho. So i and rho are all bifold points. Meaning that uh, there is a finite subgroup of gamma which stabilizes these points. But if I pass to a sufficiently small subgroup, uh, then this gadget will actually be a two-dimensional hyperbolic manifold. So it has a canonical complex structure. can also observe that, uh, of course, the complex upper half plane has a canonical complex structure. And the action of this group is by holomorphic maps. So uh, this holomorphic structure will be sent to this quotient. <coughs> and the very basic theorem about these modular curves is that 
actually they are algebraic objects. So H2 mod gamma has a canonical structure. as an algebraic variety or even curve. So if you take a one-dimensional gadget and take its complex points, it's two-dimensional as a real object uh, over C. So it's a set of solutions to some system of polynomial equations. And in fact, at least if gamma contains a subgroup gamma one of n, so those gamma which are congruent to star star zero one mod n, which is not a real loss of generality, uh, and then it's this this gadget is actually defined over So it's actually a it's the set of solutions to a system of polynomial equations with rational coefficients. So it's um, a priori, it's just some um, kind of real manifold, but then it gets more and more structure and eventually it's some very number theoretic object. And so it's a very old theorem. I'm not sure who exactly proved this, but uh, it relies on the interpretation of the space as a moduli space for elliptic curves. For small n, it, you can explicitly write down the equation, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's just one equation, three variables. I mean, it's really, it's really some very nice equation. And so if I t go to a larger level, so if I'm not contained such a subgroup, then it's still defined over finite extension, finite explicit extension of the rational number. Yeah, that's true. So maybe well, in general, you should take some finite disjoint union of such guys, and it's defined over Q. So you should really adopt the, the eidetic viewpoint in which you take a finite disjoint union of such guys. That I think it's right. I think that's really true. Yeah. So if you make this upper star smaller, then you will make the base field bigger. <coughs> and so, I mean, these lectures are about the homology of these objects, so let's talk about homology. <coughs> so, because this is an algebraic curve, uh, you know that uh, its homology groups are actually torsion free and zero i is bigger than one. Um, and so some of this torsion cohomology I've been talking about all the time. Uh, it's really the homology group of this locally symmetric space with coefficients in some finite field Fp. And so in this case, you can really just compute this as a homology with integer coefficients and then modding out P. Well, it's not compact. So. I mean, there are some points at infinity missing. Hmm? 
for every p. Well, I assume, I guess, that gamma is sufficiently small. Otherwise, I might have to exclude 2 and 3. OK, so in this case, the mod pico homology is really just a reduction of the integral homology. And on the other hand, uh, Hodge theory tells you that if you consider the homology with complex coefficients, which again is just the base change of the integral guide to the complex numbers, uh, then this can be uh, described in terms of certain harmonic functions on on this guy. And so in this case, it's really just uh, way two modular forms. <coughs> so recall that in Sayers conjecture, it was postulated that there should exist some way two modular form, which should give rise to this guy representation. So it's some element in here essentially, but because it is totally free, some uh, there's a very tight link between this guy with the complex numbers and this guy over Fp. So they are vector spaces of the same dimension, for example. <coughs> and so because of this, in this case, here's conjecture can be reformulated. in terms of this torsion homology. And this actually turns out to be the point of view that generalizes well to other groups. So it's the bigger N, for example. Um, so, so how do you formulate this conjecture here? So the remark is that because this guy is such an algebraic variety over Q, so Um, again, by this black box called et homology, there is a natural Galois action on this homology group. And so you see that in this case, there is a very tight link between the torsion homology group and Galois representations, namely the Galois group just acts on it. So it's somewhat obvious that any torsion you might have here will give rise to Galois representations. And so Sayers conjecture in this case can be reformulated as saying that this gadget Roy P that we considered earlier occurs in as a Galois covariant subcodes. And this non-existence of weight two modular forms in this case simply said that this group is zero. But then, because it is torsion free, this guy has to be zero, and this torsion homology has to be zero. <laughs> so there can nothing can appear there. So, in this very action here, this provides the link between. 
uh, torsion homology. And it's got a representation. And so I guess time's up. So next time I will explain what happens in the second case I want to talk about. So where n is 2, but now this field is an imaginary quadratic field. And so in that case, this two-dimensional hyperbolic space will become some three-dimensional hyperbolic space, and things will turn out to be very different. <laughs>